Chapter 1. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born, and what my lousy childhood was like, and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me, and all that David Copperfield kind of crap. But I don't feel like going into it, if you want to know the truth. In the first place, that stuff bores me. And in the second place, my parents would have about two hemorrhages apiece if I told anything pretty personal about them. They're quite touchy about anything like that, especially my father. They're nice and all. I'm not saying that. But they're also touchy as hell. Besides, I'm not going to tell you my whole goddamn autobiography or anything. I'll just tell you about this madman stuff that happened to me around last Christmas, just before I got pretty run down and had to come out of here and take it easy. I mean, that's all I told DB about it, and he's my brother and all. He's in Hollywood. That isn't too far from this crummy place, and he comes over and visits me practically every weekend. He's going to drive me home when I go home next month, maybe. He's got a Jaguar, one of those little English jobs that can do around 200 miles an hour. It cost him damn near 400 Four thousand bucks. He's got a lot of dough now. He didn't used to. He used to be just a regular writer when he was home. He wrote this terrific book of short stories, The Secret Goldfish, in case you never heard of him. The best one in it was The Secret Goldfish. It was about this little kid that wouldn't let anybody look at his goldfish because he bought it with his own money. It killed me. Now he's out in Hollywood, D.B., being a prostitute. If there's one thing I hate, it's the movies. Don't even mention them to me. Where I want to start telling is the day I left Pensy Prep. Pensy Prep is this school that's in Agerstown, Pennsylvania. You've probably never heard of it. You've probably seen some ads, anyway. They advertise in about a thousand magazines, always showing some hotshot guy on a horse jumping over a fence. Like as if all you ever did at Pensy was play polo all the time. I never even once saw a horse anywhere near the place. And underneath the guy in the horse's picture, it always says, Since 1888, we have been molding boys into splendid, clear-thinking young men. Strictly for the birds. They don't do any damn more molding at Pensy than they do at any other school. And I didn't know anybody there that was splendid and clear thinking and all. Maybe two guys, if that many. And they probably came to Pensy that way. Anyway, it was the Saturday of the football game with Saxon Hall. The game with Saxon Hall was supposed to be a very big deal around Pensy. It was the last game of the year and you were supposed to commit suicide or something if old Pensy didn't win. I remember around three o'clock that afternoon, I was standing way the hell up on top of Thompson Hill, right next to this crazy cannon that was in the Revolutionary War and all. You could see the whole field from there, and you could see the two teams bashing each other all over the place. You couldn't see the grandstand too hot, but you could hear them yelling, all deep and terrific on the Pensy side, because practically the whole school except me was there and scrawny and faggy on the Saxon hillside, because the visiting team hardly ever brought many people with them. There were never many girls at all at the football games. Only seniors were allowed to bring girls with them. It was a terrible school, no matter how you looked at it. I like to be somewhere at least where you can see a few girls once in a while, even if they're only scratching their arms or blowing their noses or even just giggling or something. Old Selma Thurmer, she was the headmaster's daughter, showed up at the games quite often, but she wasn't exactly the type that drove me mad with desire. She was a pretty nice girl, though. I sat next to her once on the bus from Agerstown, and we sort of struck up a conversation. I liked her. She had a big nose, and her nails were all bitten down and bleedy looking, and she had on one of those fal damn falsies that point all over the place, but you felt sort of sorry for her. But I liked about her, she didn't give you a lot of horse manure about what a great guy her father was. She probably knew what a phony slob he was. 
the reason I was standing way up on Thompson Hill instead of down at the game is because I just got back from New York with a fencing team. I was the goddamn manager of the fencing team. Very big deal. We'd gone into New York that morning for the, this fencing meet with McBurney School, only we didn't have the meet. I left all the foils and equipment and stuff on the goddamn subway. It wasn't all my fault. I had to keep getting up to look at this map so we'd know where to get off. So we got back to Pensy around 2.30 instead of around dinner time. The whole team ostracized me the whole way back on the train. It was pretty funny in a way. The other reason I wasn't down at the game was because I was on my way to say goodbye to old Spencer, my history teacher. He had the grip, and I figured I probably wouldn't see him again until Christmas vacation started. He wrote me this note saying he wanted to see me before I went home. You know I wasn't coming back to Pensy. I forgot to tell you about that. They kicked me out. I wasn't supposed to come back after Christmas vacation on account of I was flunking four subjects and not applying myself at all. They gave me frequent warnings to start applying myself, especially around midterms when my parents came up for a conference with old Thurmer, but I didn't do it, so I got the axe. They give guys the axe quite frequently at Pensy. It has a very good academic rating, Pensy. It really does. Anyway, it was December and all, and it was cold as a witch's teeth, especially on top of that stupid hill. I had only on my reversible and no gloves or anything. The week before that, somebody had stolen my camel's hair coat right out of my room with my fur-lined gloves right in the pockets and all. Pansy was full of crooks. Quite a few guys came from these very wealthy families, but it was full of crooks anyway. The more expensive a school is, the more crooks it has. I'm not kidding. Anyway, I kept standing next to that crazy cannon, looking down at the game and freezing my ass off. Only I wasn't watching the game too much. What I was really hanging on around for, I was trying to feel some kind of goodbye. I mean, I've left schools and places I didn't even know I was leaving them. I hate that. I don't even care if it's a sad goodbye or a bad goodbye, but when I leave a place, I like to know I'm leaving it. If you don't, you feel even worse. I was lucky. All of a sudden, I thought of something that helped me know I was getting the hell out. I suddenly remembered this time, in around October, that I and Robert Titchener and Paul Campbell were chucking a football around in front of the academic building. They were nice guys, especially Titchener. It was just before dinner, and it was getting pretty dark out, but we kept chucking the ball around. It kept getting darker and darker, and we could hardly see the ball anymore, but we didn't want to stop doing what we were doing. Finally, we had to. This teacher that taught biology, Mr. Zambiski, stuck his hat out of this window in the academic building and told us to go back to the dorm and get ready for dinner. If I get a chance to remember that kind of stuff, I can get a goodbye when I need one. At least most of the time I can. As soon as I got it, I turned around and started running down the other side of the hill towards old Spencer's house. He didn't live on the campus. He lived on Anthony Wayne Avenue. I ran all the way to the main gate, and then I waited a second till I caught my breath. I have no wind, if you want to know the truth. I'm quite a heavy smoker, for one thing, that is. I used to be. They made me cut it out. Another thing... I grew six and a half inches last year. That's also how I practically got TB and came out here for all these goddamn checkups and stuff. I'm pretty healthy, though. Anyway, as soon as I got my breath back, I ran across Route 204. It was icy as hell, and I damn near fell down. I don't even know what I was running for. I guess I just felt like it. After I got across the road, I felt like I was sort of disappearing. It was that kind of a crazy afternoon, terrifically cold and no sun out or anything, and you felt like you were just disappearing every time you crossed a road. 
Boy, I rang that doorbell fast when I got to the old Spencer's house. I was really frozen. My ears were hurting and I could hardly move my fingers at all. Come on, come on, I said right out loud. Almost somebody opened the door. Finally, old Mrs. Spencer opened it. They didn't have a maid or anything, and they always opened the door themselves. They didn't have too much dough. Holden, Mrs. Spencer said, how lovely to see you. Come in, dear. Are you frozen to death? I think she was glad to see me. She liked me. At least, I think she did. Boy, did I get in that house fast. Uh, how are you, Mrs. Spencer? I said. Uh, how's Mr. Spencer? Let me take your coat, dear, she said. She didn't hear me ask how Mr. Spencer was. She was sort of deaf. She hung up my coat in the hall closet, and I sort of brushed my hair back with my hand. I wear a crew cut quite frequently, and I never have a comb to comb it much. How have you been, Miss? Mrs. Spencer, I asked, only louder so she'd hear me. I've been just fine, Holden, she closed the closet door. How have you been? The way she asked me, I knew right away old Spencer told her I'd been kicked out. Uh, fine, I said. How's Mr. Spencer? He over his uh, group yet? Over it, Holden. <sighs> He's behaving like a perfect, uh, uh, I don't know what. Uh, He's in his room dear. Uh, go right in. Chapter two. They each had their own room and all. They were both around 70 years old or even more than that. They got a bang out of things though, in a half-assed way, of course. I know that just sounds mean to say, but I don't mean it mean. I just mean that I used to think about old Spencer quite a lot. And if you thought about him too much, you wondered what the heck he was still living for. I mean, he was all stooped over and he had a very terrible posture in, in class. Whenever he dropped a piece of chalk at the blackboard, some guy in the first row always had to get up and pick it up and hand it to him. That's awful in my opinion. But if you thought about him just enough and not too much, you could figure out that he wasn't doing too bad for himself. For instance, one Sunday, when some other guys and I were over there for hot chocolate, he showed us this old beat-up Navajo blanket that he and Mrs. Spencer bought off some Indian in Yellowstone Park. You could tell old Spencer got a big bang out of it, buying it. That's what I mean. He takes somebody old as hell, like old Spencer, and they can get a big bang out of buying a blanket. His door was open. But I sort of knocked on it anyway, just to be polite and all. I could see where he was sitting. He was sitting in a big leather chair, all wrapped up in this, that blanket I told you about. He looked over at me when I knocked. Who's that? He yelled. Caulfield? Come in, boy. He was always yelling outside class. It got on your nerves sometimes. The minute I went in, I was sort of sorry I'd come. He was reading the Atlantic Monthly, and there were pills and medicine all over the place, and everything smelled like Vic's nose drops. It was pretty depressing. I'm not too crazy about sick people anyway. What made it even more depressing, old Spencer had on this very sad, ratty old bathrobe that he was probably born in or something. I don't much like to see old guys in their pajamas and bathrobes anyway. Their bumpy old chests are always showing, and their legs. Old guy's legs at beaches and places, always looking so white and unhairy. Uh, hello, sir, I said. I got your note. Uh, thanks a lot. He had written me this note asking me to stop by and say goodbye before vacation started, on account of I wasn't coming back. You didn't have to do all that. I I'd have come over and say goodbye anyway. Have a seat there, boy, old Spencer said. He meant the bed. I sat down on it. Uh, how's your grip, sir? Boy, if I felt any better, I'd have sent for the doctor. Old Spencer said. That knocked him out. He started chuckling like a madman. 
Then he finally straightened himself out and said, Why aren't you down at the game? I thought this was the day of the big game. It is. I was. Only, I just got back from New York with the fencing team, I said. Boy, his bed was like a rock. He started getting serious as hell. I knew he would. So you're leaving us, eh? He said. Yes, sir. I guess I am. He started going into this nodding routine. You never saw anybody nod as much in your life as old Spencer did. You never knew if he was nodding a lot because he was thinking at all or just because he was a nice old guy that didn't know his ass from his elbow. What did Dr. Thurmer say to you, boy? I understand you had quite a little chat. Yes, we did. We really did. I was in his office for around two hours, I guess. What did he say to you? Oh, well, about life being a game and all, about how you should play it according to the rules. He was pretty nice about it. I mean, he didn't hit the ceiling or anything. He just kept talking about life being a game and all, you know? Well, life is a game, boy. Life is a game that one plays according to the rules. Yes, sir. I, I know it is. I know it. Game my ass. Some game. If you get on the side where all the hot shots are, then it's a game, all right. I'll admit that. But if you get on the other side where there aren't any hot shots, then what's a game about it? Nothing. No game. Has Dr. Thurmer written to your parents yet? Old Spencer asked me. He said he was going to write them Monday. Have you yourself communicated with them? No, sir, I haven't communicated with them, because I'll probably see them Wednesday night when I get home. And how do you think they'll take the news? Well, they'll be pretty irritated about it, I said. They really will. This is about the fourth school I've gone to. I shook my head. I shake my head quite a lot. Boy, I said. They also say boy quite a lot. Partly because I have a lousy vocabulary and partly because I act quite young for my age sometimes. I was 16 then and I'm 17 now and sometimes I act like I'm about 13. It's really ironical because I'm six foot two and a half and I have gray hair. I really do. One side of my head, the right side, is full of millions of gray hairs. I've had them ever since I was a kid and yet I still act like I was only about 12. Everybody says that, especially my father. It's partially true, but it isn't all true. People always like to think some things all true. I don't give a damn, except that I get bored sometimes when people tell me to act my age. Sometimes I act a whole lot older than I am. I really do. But people never notice it. People never notice anything. Old Spencer started nodding again. He also started picking his nose. He made out like he was only pinching it, but he was really getting the old thumb right in there. I guess he thought it was all right to do because it was only me that was in the room. I didn't care, except that it's pretty disgusting to watch somebody pick their nose. Then he said, I had the privilege of meeting your mother and dad when they had their little chat with Dr. Thumer some weeks ago. They're grand people. Uh, yes, they are. They're nice. Grand. That's a word I really hate. It's a phony. I could puke every time I hear it. Then all of a sudden, old Spencer looked like he had something very good, something sharp as a tack to say to me. He sat up more in his chair and sort of moved around. It was a false alarm, though. All he did was lift the Atlantic Monthly off his lap and try to chuck it on the bed next to me. He missed. It was only about two inches away, but he missed anyway. I got up and picked it up and put it down on the bed. All of a sudden, then, I wanted to get the hell out of the room. I could feel the terrific lecture coming on. I didn't mind the idea so much, but I didn't feel like being lectured to and smell Vic's nose drops and look at old Spencer in his pajamas and bathrobe all at the same time. I really didn't. It started all right. What's the matter with you, boy? Old Spencer said. He said it pretty tough, too, for him. 
How many subjects did you carry this term? Five, sir. Five. And how many are you failing it? Four. I moved my ass a little bit on the bed. It was the hardest bed I ever sat on. I passed English all right, I said, because I had all that Beowulf and Lord Randall and my son stuff when I was at the Wooten School. I mean, I didn't have to do any work in English at all, hardly, except write compositions once in a while. He wasn't even listening. He hardly ever listened to you when you were saying something. I flunked you in history because you knew absolutely nothing. I know that, sir. Boy, I know it. You couldn't help it. Absolutely nothing, he said over again. That's something that drives me crazy. When people say something twice that way, after you admit it the first time, then he says it three times, but absolutely nothing. I doubt very much if you opened your textbook even once on the whole term. Did you? Tell the truth, boy. Well, I sort of glanced through it a couple of times, I told him. I didn't want to hurt his feelings. He was mad about history. You glanced through it, eh? He said, very sarcastic. Your uh, exam paper is over there on top of my chiffonier. On top of the pile. Bring it here, please. It was a very dirty trick, but I went over and brought it to him. I didn't have any alternative or anything. Then I sat down in his cement bed again. Boy, you can't imagine how sorry I was getting that I'd stopped by to say goodbye to him. He started handing my exam paper like it was a turd or something. We studied the Egyptians from November 4th to December 2nd, he said. You chose to write about them for your optional essay question. Would you care to hear what you had to say? Uh, no, sir, not very much, I said. He read it anyway, though. You can't stop a teacher when they want to do something. They just do it. The Egyptians were an ancient race of Caucasians residing in one of the northern sections of Africa. The latter, as we all know, is the largest continent in the Eastern Hemisphere. I had to sit there and listen to that crap. It certainly was a dirty trick. The Egyptians are extremely interesting to us today for various reasons. Modern science would still like to know what the secret ingredients were that the Egyptians used when they wrapped up the dead people so that their faces would not rot for innumerable centuries. This interesting riddle is still quite a challenge to modern science in the 20th century. He stopped reading and put my paper down. I was beginning to sort of hate him. Your uh, essay, shall we say, ends there, he said in a very sarcastic voice. You wouldn't think such an old guy would be so sarcastic and all. However, you dropped me a little note at the bottom of the page, he said. I know I did, I said in a very, I said it very fast because I wanted him to stop before he started reading that out loud. But you couldn't stop him. He was hot as a firecracker. Dear Mr. Spencer, he read out loud, that is all I know about the Egyptians. I can't seem to get very interested in them, although your lectures are very interesting. It is all right with me if you flunk me, though, as I am flunking everything else except English anyway. Respectfully yours, Holden Caulfield. He put my goddamn paper down then and looked at me like he'd just beaten hell out of me in ping pong or something. I didn't think I'd ever forgive him for reading me that crap out loud. I wouldn't have read it out loud to him if he'd written it. I really wouldn't. In the first place, I'd only written that damn note so that he wouldn't feel too bad about flunking me. Do you blame me for flunking you, boy? He said. No, sir. I, I certainly don't, I said. I wish to hell he'd stop calling me boy all the time. He tried chucking my exam paper on the bed when he was through with it, only he missed again, naturally. I had to get up again and pick it up and put it on top of the Atlantic Monthly. It's boring to do that every two minutes. What would you have done in my place, he asked. Tell the truth, boy. Well, you could see he really felt pretty lousy about flunking me.
So I shot the bull for a while. I told him I was a real moron and all that stuff. I told him how I would have done exactly the same thing if I'd been in his place and how more most people didn't appreciate how tough it is being a teacher. That kind of stuff. The old bull. The funny thing is, though, I was sort of thinking of something else while I shot the bull. I live in New York, and I was thinking about the lagoon in Central Park, down near Central Park South. I was wondering if it would be frozen over when I got home, and if it was, where did the ducks go? I was wondering where the ducks went when the lagoon got all icy and frozen over. I wondered if some guy came in a truck and took them away to a zoo or something, or if they just flew away. I'm lucky, though. I mean, I could shoot the bull with old Spencer and think about those ducks at the same time. It's funny. You don't have to think too hard when you talk to a teacher. All of a sudden, though, he interrupted me while I was shooting the bull. He was always interrupting you. How do you feel about all this, boy? I'd be very interested to know. Very interested. You mean my... about flunking my out of pensy and all, I said. I sort of wished he'd cover up his bumpy chest. It wasn't such a beautiful view. If I'm not mistaken, I believe you also had some difficulty at the Wooten School and at Elton Hills. He, s he didn't say it's just sarcastic, but sort of nasty, too. I didn't have too much difficulty at Elton Hills, I told him. I didn't exactly flunk out or anything. I just quit, sort of. Why, may I ask? Why? Oh, well, it's a long story, sir. I mean, it's, it's pretty complicated. I didn't feel like going into the whole thing with him. He wouldn't have understood it anyway. It wasn't up his alley at all. One of the biggest reasons I left Elkton Hills is because I was surrounded by phonies. That's all. They were coming in the goddamn window. For instance, they had this headmaster, Mr. Hawes. That was the phoniest bastard I ever met in my life. Ten times worse than old Thurmer. On Sundays, for instance, old Haas went around shaking hands with everybody's parents when they drove up to school. He'd be charming as hell and all. Except if some boy had little old funny-looking parents. You should have seen the way he did with my roommate's parents. I mean, if a boy's mother was, some, was sort of fat or corny-looking or something, and if somebody's father was one of those guys that wear those suits with very big shoulders and corny black-and-white shoes... Then old Haas would just shake hands with him and give them a phony smile, and then he'd go talk for maybe an hour, a half an hour, with somebody else's parents. I can't stand that stuff. It drives me crazy. It makes me so depressed I go crazy. I hated that goddamn Elkton Hills. Old Spencer asked me something then, but I didn't hear him. I was thinking about old Haas. What, sir? I asked. Do you have any particular qualms about leaving Pensy? Oh, I have a few qualms, all right, sure. But not too many, not yet, anyway. I guess it hasn't really hit me yet. It takes things a while to hit me. All I'm doing right now is thinking about going home Wednesday. I'm a moron. Do you feel absolutely no concern for your future, boy? Oh, I feel some concern for my future, all right. Sure, sure I do. I thought about it for a minute. But not too much, I guess. Not too much, I guess. You will, old Spencer said. You will, boy. You will when it's too late. I didn't like hearing him say that. It made me sound dead or something. It was very depressing. I guess I will, I said. I'd like to put some sense in that head of yours, boy. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you if I can. He really was, too. You could see that. But it was just that we were too much on opposite sides of the pole, that's all. I know you are, sir, I said. Thanks a lot. No kidding, I appreciate it. I really do. I got up from the bed, then. Boy, I couldn't have sat there another ten minutes to save my life. The thing is, though, I have to get going now. I have quite a bit of uh, equipment at the gym I have to get to take home with me. I really do. He looked up at me and started nodding again, with this very serious look on his face. 
I felt sorry as hell for him all of a sudden. But I just couldn't hang around there any longer. The way we were on opposite sides of the pole and the way he kept missing the bed whenever he chucked something at it and his saddle bathrobe with his chest showing and that grippy smell of Vic's nose drops all over the place. Uh, look, sir, don't worry about me, I said. I mean it. I'll be all right. I'm just going through a phase right now. Everybody goes through phases and all, don't they? I don't know, boy. I don't know. I hate it when somebody answers that way. Sure, sure they do, I said. I mean, I mean it, sir. Please, don't worry about me. I sort of put my hand on his shoulder. Okay, I said. Wouldn't you like a cup of hot chocolate before you go? Mrs. Spencer would be... I, I would, I really would. But the thing is, I, I have to get going. I have to go right to the gym. Thanks, though. Thanks a lot, sir. Then we shook hands. And all that crap. It made me feel sad as hell, though. I'll drop you a line, sir. Take care of your grip now. Goodbye, boy. After I shut the door and started back to the living room, he yelled something at me. But I couldn't exactly hear him. I'm pretty sure he yelled, Good luck! at me. I hope to hell not. I'd never yell, Good luck! at anybody. It sounds terrible when you think about it.